Well, while I was away on holidays, I visited the church that I grew up in. And I'm not sure about you, but anytime I travel back somewhere, I try to imagine a little bit what things might be like. And one of the problems is that my imagination is very much stuck in time. And uh, I imagine that things will be broadly the same as they used to be, just as I remembered them. And I want to run into old friends and neighbors and chat about life and the things that we used to do. But as the years go on, change. People change. People get older. Some move. Some die. Some are born. Life never stays the same. And this church that I grew up in used to be a, just a vibrant, vibrant place. We had a youth group that met on Saturday nights, 125 young people. We had boys brigade with at least 60, girls brigade about the same number, and then there were all kinds of activities for um, the adults at that time. Uh, men's groups, women's groups, bowling, all kinds of things. The church was just a place that it was happening. And um, sometimes I, th I, I get the impression that Eastminster uh, has had a bit of that in its past. Uh, but anyway, two Sundays ago, I walk into this place and I stand at the back of the sanctuary for a few minutes and look around. And this place where I used to know everyone that darkened the door, I knew nobody. Not a soul. And um, I stood there for a while, and uh, I'm just looking at the people out there. The attendance wasn't what it used to be. 90% of the attendants, and I'm not that young, were a generation before me. And uh, it reminded me of what many churches experience in Canada. But here I was in this place, and a place where I knew everybody, and I know no one. Finally, this fellow called Leslie came up and put me out of my misery. And um, <laughs> he introduced himself, and we chatted for a while. And when he asked my name, I pointed to the chapel at the side of the, of the sanctuary. And I, I said, I'm David, the son of the minister whose name is etched in the wall of that chapel. And, uh, and he said, oh, he said, I wasn't around back then. And um, he was older than me, by the way. So he was, he was around, just not there <laughs> at that particular church. Anyway, I lingered for a little while longer. And finally, this school friend that I had arranged to meet, she came out of the choir room and uh, came up and gave me a hug. As it turned out, she was the only person I knew that Sunday. The attendance and the age demographic of the congregation reminded me of, of where the church in the West is at. It's not just there. It's a widespread problem. And we've grown a generation or two which thinks that it can do quite well without God. I've heard more than one young voice uh, say to me uh, something like, well, you know, God, church, that was for your generation, not ours. And uh, it's hard. It's uh, scary. They don't need it. They think life's good. And then grand old churches crumble. Some become carpet warehouses. Some become community centers. And it's scary for those of us who have grown up and appreciate God and church life and uh, take God seriously. We, we live with a reality that includes God and things like heaven and hell and well, not all of us, but some of these things, Jesus and uh, salvation. And now we're confronted with individuals who don't think any of that, 
who just don't care. They live their lives just like we do when they go to grocery stores for the groceries and they, uh, you know, if something goes wrong health-wise, they call a doctor and if something goes wrong with other things, they'll call a mechanic or a handyman or a lawyer, whatever, depending on the, the difficulty. And they busy themselves outside of their work with hobbies and crafts and parties and television. They just don't live with God in their worldview, in their lives, and there's no experience of God in their lives. And yet, over my holidays, I, I'm on Facebook, so there were a quite number of evenings when I would settle in for the evening and I would go through pictures that I took during the day of places I visited and I would post a few of them on Facebook. And uh, as I was doing that, I kept running into posts by my friend Howard. Howard Snyder, uh, he uh, teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary, or has done, he's, he's just retired and, and does teaching in various other places. But uh, he is a man who's devoted himself to God and has developed a habit of taking half an hour every morning to sit quietly with his Bible and a notebook and, and he engages in some prayer there. It's a discipline for him, he does it all the time. And then over the past three years or so, uh, he has taken to posting a very brief prayer on Facebook. There'll be the Monday prayer, the Tuesday prayer, the Wednesday prayer, and so on. And I've read some of these before, but while I was in holidays, and I'm thinking about this church that I used to go to and what's happening in our world, I, I noted some of the depth of Howard's prayers and their authenticity and, and something of the reality that Howard lives with and he's given his life to and the, the reality of the God who was behind it. So Sunday prayer, for instance, this was on that Sunday that I went to that church, 12th of August. Sovereign Lord, Sovereign Lord of the universe, Holy Trinity, I lay my life before you this day opening my heart, mind, and soul completely to you. Dear Lord, you know much better than I the depths of my heart and imagination and desire. Work in me by your Spirit that I may have a pure, undivided, devout heart in serving Jesus throughout this day from beginning to end. And he adds a little verse. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own that are in bonds. Let, the heaven, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. From Psalm 69. And then Friday prayer, which was just this past Friday. Lord Jesus, as you have said to love one another the way you loved your disciples, I open my heart to the ministry of your spirit that you would pour your love more fully into my heart. Holy Spirit, love others through me today. Strengthen my compassion and care for all your disciples and for all earth's peoples, I pray. Amen. And he quotes, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. And I thought, lovely prayers beautiful words, and coming from a heart and a mind that walks with God. So it seemed to me there are some people out there saying, God isn't out there, or God's of no consequence. But there are others that are living with God. The author Philip Yancey he was speaking to another author, Brennan Manning, one day about the spiritual retreats that Manning oversees. And Manning said to Yancey, he said, that not one person who has followed his regime of silent retreat has failed to hear from God. 
Now, I'm going to repeat that because it's quite a statement. Not one person who has followed his regime of silent retreat has failed to hear from God. God. God, the one that some people are denying and don't experience. Now, even Yancey, who is a very strong Christian and writes a lot of Christian books, um, he was skeptical of this claim, and he decided that he would go on one of these retreats and test it out. So he chose a five-day retreat. And uh, he said uh, during this retreat, uh, the participants would meet with Manning individually, and they're given assignments, meditation, spiritual work during the day, they would also meet for daily worship. They weren't allowed to speak in it, though only Manning spoke. And uh, otherwise, they were free to spend time much as they pleased, except that it had to be in silence, and they had to pray for two hours each day. Now, Yancey spoke of how that was going to be quite a struggle for him, because he'd never dedicated that amount of time to silence, and never spent two hours at prayer. So on the first day, he wandered off, he said, to the edge of a meadow. And he found a tree, and he sat down, and he put his back against the tree. And after a while, he wondered how long it would be until he fell asleep. And, uh, but then, something happened. And he said, 147 elk came into the meadow. He said he had much time to count them. <laughs> and uh, 147. And uh, to see them in their natural habitat, he said, was enthralling. And he watched them. And he watched them. They'd lower their heads almost in unison. And they'd pick up grass and they'd chew it. And then some raspy crow would call and they'd all look up at the same time and they'd see oh it's just a crow and they would put their heads down again and chew on grass and um, he said gradually he and his mind they began to take on the, the natural rhythms of the scene and he stopped thinking about his work at home and the deadlines that he faced and the reading that he'd been assigned. And he said his body just relaxed and his mind felt quiet. There's a 13th, 14th century uh, church leader, Meister Eckhart, who said, the quieter the mind, the more purposeful, the worthier, the deeper, the more telling, the more perfect prayer is. And Yancey said, he began to pray at a deeper level. He never saw the elk again during his retreat, but he said he found a deeper level of prayer. He was, for instance, turning 50 soon at that time, and he asked for guidance about how he should live the rest of his life. And he made lists of things. He brought a notepad and he made lists of things. And things came to mind that he said would never have come to his mind had he not been out in the field leaning up against a tree for an extended period. And he said, those days, they were like a spiritual checkup for me. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard from God. And he had to agree with Manning, eventually, that he had heard from God. And he became more convinced than ever that God finds ways to communicate to those who earnestly seek him. And it seems to be when we can somehow cultivate stillness in our lives. Like the psalmist said in this psalm, be still and know that I am God. It seems to come when it's stillness. And I began to think about it, and I, I thought, yeah. The times that I have experienced God most have been times of stillness. 
one time I remember in my, uh, I was about 20, and I was working night shift in a factory, constant night shift for 18 months. So my body clock got used to going to bed at 7 a.m. And uh, what happened on the weekends, on Saturday night, Sunday morning, Monday morning, was that most of my friends would go to bed at regular hours for people who are 20, like 3 a.m. But I had, I had four and five and six and I couldn't sleep. And in the quietness of those times, I started a journal. I mean, what 20-year-old starts a journal? You know, it was just weird. There, back in those days, there was nothing on television at that hour. Most channels actually conked out about two or three. Um, so what do you do? And uh, I look back and I encountered God. And that changed my life. And then there was, I remember a, tr a retreat for pastors that I went on, which was a prayer retreat and supposed to be silence. It wasn't five days, but it was for a whole day. And it was hard at first, but eventually, God. And then there was a thing called an ice storm that hit Toronto about three or four winters ago. You may remember it, but the whole city got sort of blacked out and there was nothing else to do but sit and look. I was lucky to have a gas fireplace and I'd sit and look at the flames from a gas fireplace and just sit and just sit. And eventually, God. There's a story about Paul Simon the singer-songwriter. And apparently, Paul Simon loved to get out of the noise of life and away with his guitar to a quiet place. And day or night, he found solace, of all things, in his bathroom. And in the bathroom, he would think, he would play, and he would sing, and he would listen, and he would write. And that popular song, the sounds of silence, hello darkness, my old friend, remember that? Came out of those moments. And uh, one commentator wrote that in his bathroom, Paul Simon found the space that we use for deep thought and communication. The place where distractions are stripped away, darkness is embraced, and we sit with mind, intellect, and instinct informing us. This realm is the realm of dreams, visions, enlightenment. And as a Christian, I would also say of God. A place where God can meet us. Now, I'm not sure that we can all go off on five-day retreats like Yancey, or even if we'd want to. I'm not sure we would go off and sit in the bathroom for hours like Paul Simon, or if we would want to. But perhaps we can find a quiet place somewhere in our lives, maybe like Howard Snyder, just in the morning before anyone else rises in the house, and be still and know that I am God. And I wonder if our culture, if it could somehow rediscover and value stillness and getting away from the sounds of all the static that surrounds us, maybe then our culture would also re regain a sense of God. Let us pray. Lord, you call us into a quiet place. It's not easy for us. There's much going on many distractions, many things to busy ourselves with. Much takes up our time and our energies. And yet, it seems that if we are to find you, the quiet places seem to be those that open our ears like no other. We pray, O oh God, that you would 
help us to reach out and find you. We pray that you would help us to deepen our spiritual lives, to get to know you. And in this, may we be buoyed in our lives by the strength that comes from your presence. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.